Hello, jean -Dou. Hey, good morning, Kevin. Good morning. So this is part six on the orders in our little mini series on the orders. And the last time you were discussing the connection between the orders and memory, and you wanted to continue with that again today. So over to you, jean -Dou. Yes. Okay. Um, so to to put a perspective on this, uh, you have to remember that uh, we are discussing what we call directions, which are new orders that, uh, as you will see, in fact, um, describe movements of the different parts. So the, the, the main idea was that um, these directions, these new orders, are designed for the performance of a connected series of acts of uh, what we call for the moment preliminary acts because that's how Alexander defines the means whereby principles. This idea that you have a, a global attitude or a global gesture and that gesture can be in fact uh, seen as a composition of different movements of different parts. What we call conscious guidance is uh, the capacity to uh, direct deliberately these movements with instructions. So uh, this raises a question that Alexander has uh, really developed. It's a question of uh, how these instructions for movement should be memorized. That's, uh, that's the plot. So uh, we, we start here with, um, um, first of all, I think we are going to, to go and see what Alexander uh, do what he does to introduce uh, uh, this, this question and it's in conscious take conscious control of the individual and from that I will develop on the practical aspect so because otherwise uh, my fear is that if we discuss uh, Alexander's idea on the memory of the others uh, it's going to be very dry and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that many people may understand in well we have difficulty, first of all, understanding or place a construction of their own on what we are saying. So it's better to have a clear idea of uh, the problem of memory when we are talking of uh, the means whereby principles. So let's start with uh, with Alexander. So is um, is saying that uh, is is talking about uh, something that happened in in a lesson with a pupil. So he says the following is an incident in this connection, in connection with memory, which occurred recently during a lesson in re-education in the writer's own experience. The writer is F.M. Alexander. Uh, the pupil was asked to listen to certain simple instructions which involved the use of the lips, tongue and jaw in the order named. Of course, the necessary work in regard to the general coordination, uh, the general coordinated use of the organism during such teaching had already been given. The first time the instruction were given, it was obvious that before the teachers had finished speaking, the pupil was trying to memorize them as they were given by a physical sensory process, by trying to feel the instruction as they were spoken, rather than acquire them by process of remembering, committing to memory, as we say. So, um, Alexander is uh, working with a pupil and uh, at the moment uh, he's describing, is uh, giving instruction. What that means that he's uh, speaking aloud the instruction. It's all that, that means. There is no sort of manipulation involved at that moment. He's just giving uh, a series of instructions. Of course, um, when you declare, when you speak to somebody, which are the, the instructions, you give them one after the other. Uh, when the Alexander say that the, the pupil is trying to memorize the instructions as they are given, I think that he's referring to that fact, 
that the pupil is uh, hearing, well, one instruction after the other, because that's the way we can transmit them, yes? And you will see uh, later that this is uh, fundamental to the understanding of the problem of memory and, uh, and the verbal instructions that we are given and re which refer to, uh, as we've seen before, coordinated series of acts. So acts happening at the same time in different directions. You, are, you will understand that if you memorize each instruction after the other, and especially as uh, Alexander is pointing to, if you memorize them uh, by a physical sensory process, by feeling them, you will feel one instruction at a time. You will, in fact, um, represent in your, in your mind the um, effect one instruction at a time would have on your own organism, considering that your organism needs, uh, of course, reeducation. So what it means is that the impression you're going to have is the impression through a badly coordinated organism of one instruction, one movement, which means that that movement, you will like enact the movement, produce the move, perform a simulac of that movement, uh, while the movement of the other part that should be coordinated with it are not happening. So the impression you're going to get will never be that that will uh, occur if you were producing all the movements at the same time. So uh, when uh, we listen to what Alexander is saying, we see that he's aware of that problem of uh, receiving instruction given one after the other, when in fact these instructions have to be produced all together. So, so rather, is, rather than yeah. me, um, remembering the instructions conceptually, the person does them a little bit each time they hear them. Oh yes, oh yes. It's, uh, it's extremely difficult when people have not been trained in the uh, conscious guidance and control at first to uh, inhibit these movements. I, I can see, I, I work with teachers and uh, as, I, as I speak, I see them adjusting all the time, you know? So, uh, of course, this has to be dealt with uh, gently. Uh, it's no point telling the people you're doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it, uh, and the time during a lesson. It's, it's, it's not the problem. It's more interesting to, uh, well, see that as the person will uh, nonetheless organize our structure in a different way, progressively, the tendency will, will start to lessen and uh, not disappear, certainly not, but, but lessen. And when it's lessen, when it's uh, uh, within reach of the conscious guidance of the person, then uh, I can come back and say, I see that you are performing the instruction as I say them. Uh, why is it are you performing this instruction? And most of the time people will answer as exactly as the pupil of Alexander is going to answer in the next part. Uh, the person will say, well, it's, it's to memorize them. It's to, it's, it's to well, some, some people would say embodied, uh, embody these instructions, they capture the instruction in by a sensory process. So um, obviously uh, trying to feel uh, instructions is uh, incorrect. So you have to, to realize that it's incorrect for the pupil, uh, even when the pupil is not touched to do this process. But uh, you have to realize that I consider that uh, memorizing instructions by sensory process when the teacher is uh, manipulating the pupil is no better. Uh, because um, <clears throat> when the pupil is hearing an instruction 
and the hands of the, of the teacher, of the somatic teacher, are manipulating at the same time different parts. The sensory impression that the, the pupil is perceiving at that moment is a mix of his own uh, perception uh, of the result of that, in that interaction could have had with uh, the, the strange, uh, enormously strange feeling he's receiving with the hands of the teacher. So uh, to imagine that the pupil could get, um, well, an insight into uh, the real meaning of the instruction completely missed the point because uh, uh, the point is that uh, these instructions separated from the organization of a mechanism uh, can only lead to wrong doing, to wrong organization, to wrong letting go. So um, the, here we are clearly uh, facing a central problem and uh, as I said, this problem is uh, quite complex, so it's better to, in fact, in, to see uh, in, in details and uh, practically what we mean by a coordinated series of instructions. That's why I'm going to, to take an example. I've, I've found uh, this example on, on the net. On the, on the internet is to, uh, we see uh, a peculiar activity. Uh, we have, um, well, I've, I've put a lot of colors to disguise the identity of uh, the somatic teacher that is presented here. Um, we, we see a person kneeling and uh, the activity is apparently to put the hands uh, around the ears of a person that is lying down on the floor. Uh, that happens often in uh, these uh, somatic lessons. Uh, this is of interest to us, uh, not to criticize, but to see how uh, this concept of coordination of movements that are given prior to the act can, could be used here, yes? So we need to analyze what is the reaction of the person when a certain act is produced. We are going to make, this is an, an analysis in activity. So it's absolutely obvious that uh, the person is uh, stimulated by uh, the idea of bringing the hands forward. So we have one act, bringing the hands forward, and the person is uh, very intent in producing a good uh, stimulus to the person. And uh, the teachers has, has put that in, in a website to advertise her work. So apparently she does not see anything wrong with it. And uh, I've seen comments of other teachers uh, uh, who have been and looked at these, uh, who have been in this website and looked at these pictures. Uh, none of them made any comments regarding the uh, manner of use of that person, which uh, made me think that maybe they don't consider that that manner of use is um, uh, incorrect, which I do. Yes, you will see, you will see why. So uh, it's absolutely obvious here that the legs are, uh, well, fixed in space because uh, the person is uh, kneeling on them. So we know that uh, the legs are, well, like static and uh, we can see what could be the movements uh, that the person has made in order to produce that gesture. So there are different things of interest here. We can see that uh, I've uh, well outlined the different parts in the mechanism of the torso because I wanted to see which, which, which could be the direction of these movements. So there is uh, obviously the lower part of the torso, uh, which is mainly the pelvis, it's a bone. And so we can imagine uh, what are the directions of the movements of this uh, of this part. And uh, we will see that uh, the anterior superior iliac crest, the frontal part of the pelvis, is has been moved forward toward the legs. Yes. And that the sitting bones, which is the lower extremity of the lower part of the torso, are, are moved back. 
so that uh, this activity, this movement of the pelvis relatively to the leg, which shortens uh, tremendously the upper part of the thigh, which there is a very long muscle that is connecting the iliac to uh, the top of the knee, the top of the leg, and uh, that muscle is really shortened here. While on the opposite, the muscle, the quadriceps, uh, is shortened at the front, but on the other side, the hamstring is really uh, limp. It's absolutely released totally, and we see that the sitting bones are very far back. As a result, uh, the lower part of the spine is affected. The lower part of the spine is really brought very far forward and down. Yes, and we see on the opposite that the upper torso, uh, I've put a red mark on the top of the sternum, and uh, I've even given it a name, we call it the throat. We see that uh, in response to that collapse of the lower part of the torso to the legs, uh, there is a, an antagonistic movement that is performed. The person is pulling the upper torso backward uh, in order not to, certainly not to fall on, the, on top of the pupil. As a result of these two movements, uh, we have a movement of the middle torso that is thrown forward. That's what Alexander, Alexander describes uh, in his visual observation of his pupil as a protruding abdomen and a protruding shoulder blade at the back. And there is a marked shortening of the back. The geometry is, uh, is easy to, to spot, yes? And so, we see that um, this geometry can be analyzed. We, we can measure by analyzing, we, we, we mean control, control by uh, direct measurements. We are talking about bony parts and uh, we can calculate very easily, sometimes using a ruler, a, ruler, a wooden ruler. Uh, well, what is the distance? of these different spots to a vertical frame of reference. Uh, very often during a lesson, I ask the pupil to be sitting or standing in front of a wall so that this kind of uh, geometrical control can be made. And so what we see here is a result of coordinated acts that the person has performed simultaneously. This is the habitual movements of the parts. The idea be behind conscious guidance and conscious control is exactly what I'm explaining here. As soon as you start to describe the movements of the different part that lead to a certain attitude or posture, if you want, uh, well, it, it stands to reason that then you can think of uh, ways to command these movements in order to get different attitude or posture in space. Uh, and uh, what is very important is that uh, when you use that type of analysis, of geometrical analysis in space, well, uh, of course, uh, you can uh, increase defects, you can increase the pressure, the intrathoracic pressure, the intra-abdominal compression by uh, making the gesture worse or you could start thinking of uh, asking the person to create a series of movement that would uh, improve that uh, attitude that would improve and change the geometry of uh, the whole structure once the person has performed all the movements together at the same time yes there, there are problems in this, uh, in this uh, pedagogical uh, endeavor. You have to understand that, uh, of course, when the person is performing that action, uh, she's not aware that she's shortening the back in that way. She, she, what, she, what she's done here is um, uh, she's, in, in fact, uh, allowed herself to be guided by what feels easy, by what feels right, and she's, uh, uh, well, quite at ease in this attitude. Uh, 
Well, of course, after a few lessons given this way, she may find uh, uh, that she suffers from different problems. Because, of course, when the, the pelvis is uh, so uh, directed as to shorten one side of the muscle of the thigh and completely uh, releasing, making the other part flaccid, well, you, can, you must understand the, that this is going to have an impact. For example, it will have an impact when the person is standing, uh, the muscle of the front of the thigh will be short and uh, ready to act because they are in use most of the time, while uh, the muscle, the extensors of the, uh, of the pelvis at the, at the back, which is the, uh, the uh, the hamstring muscle will be very difficult to connect to, very difficult to put into, act in, in, into activity. So uh, the, by the performance, the repeated performance of this manner of use, we enter into like a physiological world, if you want, the, of the, the conditions of use. The conditions of use are the result of the manner of use repeated constantly. So when it's going to be time to ask the person to move the pelvis in a different way, in a way opposite to our manner of use, you will find that the condition of use are not present. The condition of a different part of a different movements are not present on the both the mental and the physical part. On the mental part, the person will feel uh, like uh, uh, the need of a strenuous effort to engage the hamstring muscle. The hamstring muscle have been released for so long. Imagine the person lying down in bed for months. Well, when she wakes up and wants to go and run in the mountain, well, you, you must understand that at first it's going to be very tough. It's exactly the same here. When the person has been used to shortening one side and releasing another, when you need to, when you need to command a new organization of the relation between the middle of the lower part of the torso and the upper part of the mechanism of the legs, well, suddenly you're faced with uh, the certainty of uh, strenuous work. Well, the person will feel it as strenuous. Imagine that she's, um, uh, she's been uh, taught that uh, ease should be the rule that uh, releasing should be the means whereby obtaining new movements. Well, the first time she's going to have a lesson with me, it's going to feel like, uh, well, uh, like torture, really. Because she will find that every time she wants to, for example, let's say we create an instruction, and I say, I pull the sitting bone forward toward the legs, and I pull the iliac away from the side of the knee and back in space. These are two instructions that I want the person to think and uh, uh, combine in order to start and see if she can perform these two activities at the same time. This is what we mean by coordinated series of acts. So we want to see when the person is filmed whether she can direct these movements. Well, uh, these are not going to be easy to obtain. And as soon as the person has obtained a new geometry, well, she will, she will also find that it's, uh, it's absolutely inhabitual for her to have such a length in the uh, biceps femoris, that is the muscle, that is the top muscle of the, of the hamstring. Uh, the person, I, I, often I have a teacher tell me uh, well, yes, I'm doing, I've, I've been doing the, the four orders simultaneously, but um, I'm really contracting the top of the thigh in order to obtain it. So then you realize that the sensory perception that the teacher has of her own uh, system in activity is uh, totally incorrect because uh, what she, the person, translates as a, a tension, a contraction in the top of the thigh uh, is in fact uh, the effect of uh, tensile stress. It's she's lengthening the quadriceps, yes? And when she's lengthening the quadriceps, her impression, her physical impression, is that she's contracting. In fact, she's resisting 
uh, the movement. The movement is to lengthen and apparently she's resisting it. She wants to go uh, up with the uh, front of the, the pelvis, but at the same time, her habit is to go the other way. So even when she wants to, and when she commands herself to go back with the iliac away from the side of the knee, in fact, she feels a contraction. It's absolutely necessary then to uh, start to reason with the person, to reason not on the basis of what she feels, but to reason on the basis of the exact uh, result, or Alexander says effect, that the movement is causing. It's always necessary to go back to the cause and effect system and tell the person, well, if you are pulling the iliac away from the side of the knee, what is the effect on the tissue that is on the top of the thigh? Is it shortening or is it lengthening? At first, the person wants to say shorten, but very quickly, the person suddenly realizes that uh, she likes to shorten. And um, uh, as we've discussed before, the idea that lengthening is a real solution. We always look for that idea that we want to, in fact, lessen the compression in the tissues and in particular in the muscular tissues. We want to lengthen because when we lengthen muscle, we increase their elastic uh, response. And uh, as this elastic response is, uh, in fact, force, we in in increase the elastic resistance of the whole system. The system is more springy when the muscles lengthen. So there is one on one side a shortening that is very marked on the front of the thigh so that the person feels that this is uh, a contraction when it's not. And on the other side of the thigh, in relation with the lower part of the mechanism of the torso, we have a, a complete release. That is, the muscle is limp. The muscle is not doing anything. So there is nothing to oppose the collapse of the pelvis forward. So when you ask the person to direct the sitting bone forward in space, well, uh, the person will have to, in fact, command without, of course, making a direct effort. She will just think in her mind, I want the sitting bone to move forward. Well, that requires the, the muscle that is un, under the thigh to enter into action. And uh, when the muscle is not going to respond, the person will have to increase her mental effort. And so uh, when the person is confronted with this, we, what is she going to remember? What, what, what sort of memory uh, are, we, are we trying to uh, obtain here? It's certainly not a physical, uh, a sensory, remembering of these acts because uh, the acts and the feeling they produced are not related. They will change. As soon as the person starts to really lengthen the front of the thigh and really engage the back of the thigh together, uh, the feeling is going to change completely. It's, uh, it's like uh, when you train you train and it's, it's a great effort, for example, to run five miles. Then if you continue to run five miles every day, after a while running five miles is nothing. It's like, uh, it's like not running at all. It's exactly the same thing when you, t when you consider any movements, any combination of movements of the parts of the torso in relation with the other parts of the mechanisms. So when the person is uh, reacting in the way she does on this picture, it's obvious that she has a, a memory that is uh, associated with her way of, uh, of leaning forward. Uh, that memory is uh, for her correct and it, it, she feels nice. She would, she would not uh, uh, start to work for quite some time, for quite a few minutes, if this position was uh, unknown to her. I, I mean, the feeling associated was that position. The memory of the feeling associated with the position, if you see my meaning, is uh, for her correct. She feels okay. 
And if she was to direct the movements of the part in a different way in relation with the different parts, the, the different other mechanism, well, at first she would feel absolutely uh, awful, horrendous, yes? So there are difficulties. Now, what I want to show is uh, we've seen the relationship between the lower part of the torso and the leg, but it's also important here to, before I go and explore memory further, uh, to explore um, what is happening between the mechanism of the arm and the mechanism of the torso. It may not be clear here, but that's why I want to point to it, that um, the arm is really very far back. The upper torso is thrown forward, yes, in the middle here, uh, and back at the top, and the arm is retracted. This, we, we, we know it's retracted because the, uh, we see a peculiar shape at the back of the torso. Uh, the upper back, we see that the, uh, the shoulder blade is protruding at the back. This means that, uh, in fact, the arms are drawn backward relatively to the top of the torso. So, uh, because of this, um, the ribs cannot be lifted backward. That's why then they sag forward and down. So when we are going to imagine uh, a new series of orders, because here they are, they, this is the old way, uh, the person is not even giving orders to the different parts. It's as if the gesture happened uh, by itself. The person wants to lean and, and place her hands on the, he on the head, and there is no reason decision that, is, that are taken in order to move the different parts. The person doesn't does not realize that she's pulling the shoulder uh, with the torso and that she's pulling the shoulder more than the upper torso backward. Uh, this is uh, embodied cognition. The, the person has no conscious guidance of these acts. So uh, when we are going to introduce the idea of conscious guidance, the first thing is to have the person memorize not a particular uh, movement of the parts, no. It's uh, absolutely necessary that the person starts to have an idea that when we talk of conscious guidance and control, we are talking of the geometry of the whole. And we will see that the geometry of the whole is the, the sum of the movements of the different parts. So, we want to make sure that the person realizes that when she does one movement, let's say we are, we are going to say to the person, it would be interesting to locate the ribs at the front of the torso. There is one rib that is very easy to find, the eight ribs number eight, and it's related with the, the, the very center of the thoracic curve that is totally flattened in this example. The person is really arching the upper back so that the thoracic cavity is well nearly reduced to to now. The, the upper uh, lungs are completely flattened inside the chest, so the person is losing nearly a third of her respiratory capacity here. And uh, there is one rib, and that rib goes right up to a certain point, which is the, uh, the, the space between the seventh and eighth thoracic vertebrae. So when we ask the person to move one spot in space, we will see, as Alexander has pointed out, that uh, <clears throat> there is a direct relation between the position of a rib and the position of the vertebrae which with it is articulated. So when the person is moving one rib, the vertebrae is moving, which means that the shape of the spine is going to change. But there is something more important that the person must discover by herself, by observing her own gestures, her own movement, when she responds to the command of uh, uh, the teacher, when the teacher is asking the person to, in fact, think, of the movement of a part. So let's say we want to, to direct that part. I say, I want this part, which is ribs eight, I pull that rib eight back and upward. Let's say we want a movement. And the person 
will discover that this movement will directly affect the spine at a certain height. That is not the same because the, the ribs are moving uh, really upward relatively to the frontal plane of the torso. But what the person will discover and what the teacher must point out is that when the person is moving one point, apparently there are other spots on the frontal part of the torso that are moving with it reflex without the person trying to do anything when the person is moving the ribs back she will find that she has a tendency to move the upper spot at the same time roughly in the same direction and the person at first says yes yes everybody does this when i move this the other part move in the same direction well that is a uh, of great interest to us because of course if you decide to well, use a number of orders to change the, uh, the shape of the torso. Well, it's because it's necessary to use a number of orders. Uh, one order is going to translate the problem somewhere else, which is that the person is going to go back with the middle torso and with the upper torso also. It's absolutely necessary to understand the concept uh, that we are working with is that the concept of antagonistic action. If you want to straighten a bar, let's say you have an elastic bar that is red like this, and you have a, a few spots on which you can act on it. And let's say you have the idea of, uh, of lengthening that bar, which means uh, in geometrical terms to straighten the bar. Straightening and lengthening in Alexander's explanation of lengthening the back are a synonym. It's the same thing. So you will need more than one action. If you try to move any of these spots or any two spots of this uh, bar, you will find that the other parts are going to react and uh, uh, you're not going to unbend the bar unless you can apply at least three, three directions of movement at the same time. The two uh, upper extremities have to be moved in opposite direction to the central one. Otherwise, uh, any movement applied separately is going to, in fact, uh, transform the problem. Oh yes, you may look different. It may, it may look even better, but uh, uh, the problem will be disguised and will be even more difficult to find. Uh, what is important is to understand that the first memory that, the, that we need to ignite in the pupil is not a memory of uh, each separate instructions. It's uh, uh, an understanding that we are working with the coordinated system. If, uh, if the pupil forgets that idea, the pupil will go into all sorts of engaining actions, which are actions that are, in fact, uh, separated from the coordinated whole. And as they are, well, you will have an impact on a very uh, specific region, and all the rest is going to fight against it. And you have no, there is no hope of succeeding in changing the coordination of the part in a correct way, in the correct direction, in, in, in this manner. And so uh, the problem of memory in the, the construction of conscious guidance is not um, the memory of the orders themselves first. It's the memory of the procedure we're using. The idea that um, uh, if we do not remember the process, if we do not remember the, what Alexander called the principle, yes, uh, then you, you end up with uh, a series of different uh, uh, separate action, release here or release there, or uh, uh, try to feel free somewhere and uh, then feel free somewhere else. And uh, obviously, as we see how that person was leaning forward in order to work, uh, this does not lead to a reorganization of uh, the mechanisms of the upper torso relatively to the arm and middle and lower torso relatively to the legs, which means that the person is not progressing, really. The person is lost in embodied cognition. And uh, uh, the only way 
to um, uh, go and uh, like above that kind of problem is to is to start with conscious guidance from the world go to explain to the pupil and, and come back to this idea that we are working with a coordinated mechanism and uh, the only way to work with a mechanism that is coordinated is to well invent coordinations and not separate acts so um, this is um, uh, the idea that is behind the first problem of memory. I'm not saying that is, this is the only problem, there are others, um, but I want to, um, to base what I've been explaining uh, because it's quite interesting to see that these ideas are present, present in the books. Uh, I have here another uh, image that is representing uh, a part of uh, the first book. This is, um, uh, this is the first edition of Man's Supreme Inheritance. This is 1910. It's, uh, uh, as <laughs> some teachers say, it's the time when Alexander was shouting instruction across the, across the room. Um, I, I do not believe he was shouting instruction. I've never seen uh, that uh, pedagogical uh, system work in practice. Shouting instruction is not going to make any difference. Yes. Um, but he says that uh, any uh, alteration in the geometry of the spine, well, he says that any alteration in the spine must necessarily affect the position and working of the ribs we see that by increasing the thoracic capacity and so increasing the distance between the end of these ribs, we are applying a mechanical principle which by reverse action tend to straighten the spine. So uh, I, I've transformed the, the sentence a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry about it. Say, um, so a little consideration that, that's, well, is, uh, is playing funny here. It's obvious that very, very few people are considering the effect of the movement of the ribs on the geometry of the spine. Uh, I, I, don't, I haven't heard anybody mentioning the fact uh, before I read Alexander uh, putting the thing in the open. So uh, when we are talking, uh, Alexander is talking about alteration in the spine. You have to understand that uh, uh, he's talking about changing uh, the geometry of the spine. That is my translation. We are not talking about an alteration in the sense of uh, a necrosis or a bone uh, growth in the spine. It's not, the, it's not that. It's uh, the habitual shape we give to the spine can be changed either for good or for bad. You can increase uh, the what you will say, uh, the curves in the spine, so that as to reduce the, uh, for example, breathing capacity or the thoracic capacity, yes? And, um, uh, or you can use the, uh, the system in order to increase uh, the thoracic capacity and the abdominal uh, support. So, uh, this is important to compare with what Alexander is himself uh, doing uh, in, uh, in his lessons. So I have a picture here of the end of uh, a lesson is giving on film. So excuse the, qu the quality is very poor, but uh, we see that uh, that is the end of the lesson is uh, completely changed the geometry of the spine of the person. So, uh, it's important to realize that uh, the upper ribs are very much uh, shorter. Uh, they make a very much narrower opening than uh, the ribs that are, for example, under the armpit. And so, uh, when we look at what Alexander is doing, we see that, of course, he's lengthened the lower spine between the lower part of the torso and the middle part of the torso. Yes, but what we see at the top is what uh, uh, different teachers, I remember uh, the Barlows, they, are, they call that the hump, and Alexander's friend, uh, Brown, said it was the hump too. The hump is like uh, uh, if the person was lying down, it's as if the person would be levitating. 
with uh, the first thoracic vertebrae. You see that the first thoracic vertebrae, where the first rib is attached, is very far away from the line of the back. This is the shape Alexander considered was a position of mechanical advantage. It, when I saw these, uh, these films, I completely uh, marveled. I, I was astonished because uh, this uh, organization of the parts that we see in all the, the first generation teacher has been completely forgotten nowadays. This is not but we see here the application of the principles that uh, the ribs are moved in a, a very uh, clear geometrical position, not at the back, but at the front. But I started to realize that in, just in order to obtain that shape, well, it was very, it was a simple question of movement and aiming different bony parts uh, in reference to an external reference, uh, spatial reference. Uh, so let's imagine there is a wall in front of that gentleman and you use a, a rule of the same length and you will find that it's possible, in fact, to uh, align the frontal spot, bony spots of the torso. And if you achieve this, uh, first of all, you will discover that you will have to lengthen or that moving the different parts horizontally which is uh, something that most people would not think about, produces a result that is uh, in the uh, vertical direction. If you want to align these spots on the frontal plane of the torso, you will find that you need to lengthen. You need to lengthen the stature. It's absolutely amazing to realize that uh, the technique is indirect in a very simple way that uh, just by thinking forward and backward movement, you can obtain a very marked lengthening of the spine that looks uh, quite similar to the one we see Alexander producing here. So again, there is a problem here because when the person is uh, sub uh, well uh, accepting to uh, divert our attention and not interfere with the movement of the manipulator, well, uh, it's difficult to imagine that the person could uh, remember uh, the concept that uh, we are working with a coordinated system and that um, he should not memorize the position. He should, uh, he should think of each uh, instructions as uh, coordinated together at the same time. And so when we uh, see uh, what could be a conscious guidance and control system, you have to remember that uh, the verbal instruction that we use, which are verbal instruction of movement, you will find that uh, when the person is uh, acting, that's uh, another image, we are working uh, for a very particular geometry which one we, we want to, to obtain, for example, I have here uh, the lower uh, part of the torso, the pelvis, and you can see that the person has this habit of having the frontal part of the, of the pelvis forward. And of course, as we are rotating around a point that is behind, if you go forward, you will go down because that's the, how the rotation is working. And you will find that the sitting bones are going back. As a result, Alexander says that the, the shape of the spine is controlled by the movement of the ribs. Uh, well, uh, the pelvis is not a rib, but you must understand that the same reasoning applies. If you want to control the lower part of the spine, you have to control the movements of the different parts of the pelvis at the same time. Yes, and we see that when uh, the person is directing the movement in a position, so the sitting bones are going forward, we see that the iliacs are going back, and at the same time that the person is uh, moving the ribs eight back and up, we see uh, a, a change of uh, shape of the uh, thoracolumbar spine. It's absolutely obvious that uh, anybody can do that. Uh, we are not showing the upper torso and you have to understand that, of course, if the person is able to produce that gesture, this is just a part of it. It's not the whole thing because we have to, to know what is happening with the, with the 
upper spot of the frontal part of the torso because very often the person is able to combine three movements but you must understand that these three movements are not sufficient if the upper part of the torso is uh, still orientated in the same way relatively to the middle torso as before. So the person must progressively discover that yes, we want to change the shape and uh, the change of shape is going to involve a very peculiar mental activity. The person has to divert our attention on four movements at the same time. Maybe you don't know this, but uh, it's impossible to feel four movements at the same time, or five or six, or Alexander say up to 12 movements. You cannot uh, feel the effect of four movements uh, as a way to guide these movements. The only way to guide these movements is to have an idea of um, how the system would work, why we would want the system to work. For example, why would we want to have that, that very strange hump at the top? If the person doesn't know why we have a hump, the person will not have a hump, will not be able to direct the hump properly which means that, so you see here two different uh, uh, pictures, uh, there are two different Alexander teachers, they are both well known, and one is uh, using the old system of conscious guidance and control, and the other one is using the somatic system. And we see a very marked difference in the, the organization of the middle and lower part of the torso. Alexander is absolutely clear that he's organizing the middle part of the torso in order to lengthen the spine. While here, Marjorie Barlow is clearly arching the spine. Once again, we see the, uh, the upper torso pulled back. Yes. And so if you draw a line, uh, on the lower middle part of the torso and measure the distance of that line to the head, you will see that Alexander had the head very far forward to that line. Well, if you try to draw the line, you will find that the head of uh, Marjorie Barlow is pulled back relative to it. It's not that the neck or the head are pulling back, no. It's that the shape of the spine, of the thoracic spine, is such that, in fact, uh, it's impossible to have the head forward and up when you are arching the spine and the upper torso is going backward. So I have drawn um, two different diagrams, and we see on one side that Alexander is uh, using a, a principle that if there is a, an elastic mechanism at the back, and you bring the upper torso forward, you are creating a cantilever. The cantilever uh, brings a weight uh, away from the supporting structure. So as a result, it's creating something we call a moment of force. It's a rotation. There, there is a rotation involved. And we see that in this way, Alexander is using the weight of the upper torso, of the arm and of the head as a, a loading mass that is going to stretch the main spring of the body that is, the, that is at the back. While on the other side, we see that by retracting the upper torso backward, relatively to the middle torso, well, Marjorie Barlow is not using that system. So uh, a coordinated series of acts have to be, in fact, uh, thought, transformed into decisions of movements. And these decisions of movement have to be made at the same time. This gives the, the principle of uh, uh, the means whereby inactivity. While on the other side, the somatic way, uh, do what you feel uh, is uh, best. Uh, so even with your hands when you're touching the pupil or uh, in the direction of your own system leads to a very, very different outcome. And so uh, just to finish on this, because I think there is more to say, uh, when we are discussing the mainspring, there is a reality, there is a scientific reality behind this now. At the time when Alexander was explaining his technique, of course, uh, the scientific system was still in infancy, especially regarding uh, 
the mechanisms of movement of human movement and so nowadays we we have uh, plenty of articles that are describing in fact things that we did not we did, that was ignored before which is uh, there was this uh, focus this concentration of the idea of muscles uh, every movement is uh, produced by muscles i hear this uh, sentence repeated time and time again uh, in fact, nowadays, uh, it's more and more uh, clear that, first of all, uh, the, the matrix, the, the basis of the tissue is the same for muscle and, uh, and for fascia. Uh, you have to understand that the difference between fascia and muscle is just that muscles have one type of, of fibers more than in fascia. There are contractile fibers in muscles, but in muscles and fascia, there are many elastic fibers too. We know that the uh, strength of a muscle, the force a muscle is capab capable of producing, is much greater when you use it as a spring, when you lengthen it, rather than when you contract it, when you shorten it, you know, with an active uh, uh, process uh, that is going to cost you some energy. No, uh, the, the passive muscle is exactly functioning as a fascia. So what we see here is that each vertebrae is uh, connected to the next by a very dense uh, web of uh, elastic fascia, elastic structures, elastic tissues. And um, on this picture, there is one thing that you need to note is that there are uh, dots, uh, single lines on the top here. But when you come to the thoracolumbar region, you see that there are cross dots. Uh, this is a representation of a physical criteria, a physical characteristic of the fascia. There are fascia with uh, um, unidirectional and bidirectional uh, reinforced elastic fibers. So we have here a system that will respond not only to lengthening, but also to widening. It's an elastic structure. And so as any elastic structure, it only works when you stretch it. If you do not, if you shorten, for example, uh, what will happen is that, uh, well, of course, uh, the tissue will deliver no force and on top, the tissue will not uh, improve its uh, resistance capacity. It's, you have to understand that these tissue, they do uh, respond to work, which means that the more you lengthen them and the more force they are going to uh, produce. There is a sentence written by Alexander in which he says that um, voluntarily reducing a protruding abdomen will control many other muscles, notably those of the back. Well, uh, when I read this sentence in Man's Supreme Inheritance, I was very surprised because he's, uh, he's talking about uh, uh, something that is like pulling the belly back is like uh, reducing voluntarily a protruding abdomen uh, while well, you are not only moving bones moving the pelvis or the ribs to affect the shape of the spine is saying you're also pulling the abdomen back well i've never heard a modern alexander teacher uh, taking on that uh, that idea but well the first thing was for me to uh, establish whether Alexander was joking or not, or whether there could be anything, anything real in this absolutely strange idea of doing something with the muscle of the abdomen. So the muscle of the abdomen, they are, there is the internal, external oblique, the transversus abdominis. I am, pu I, am my, I am pointing on the diagram to these muscles, and these muscles have a, a large tendon. That large tendon uh, is linked uh, directly to the thoracolumbar fascia. You see TRA, transversal abdominis. And so you can see that by uh, reducing a protruding abdomen, by pulling the belly back, if you want, uh, what you are doing, you are in fact, uh, of course, when you pull at the front, at the back, what is happening is that you're widening, you're stretching horizontally that uh, thoracolumbar fascia. And the direct effect that this would have would be to increase the elastic resistance of the fascia at the back. There is no, you cannot have any direct action on the fascia. 
you cannot decide to lengthen the fascia or to or to contract the fascia or do anything with the fascia because they they are not uh, innervated like muscles. So the first idea is that if you want to lengthen a fascia, you have to move the different parts to which the fascia is attached. So that's that's one thing. So there is uh, also very few uh, sensory uh, captors in the in the fascia. There are. But, uh, and they are responsible very often for pain. But uh, in order to direct a movement, you, you don't get any, any sort of sensory indication that the fascia is involved. So uh, you will feel that when muscles are stretched, when muscles are tensed, but uh, I've never felt anything of uh, the stretching of the fascia. It's only when I watch a video of a gesture that I will know whether the fascia is involved or not. Or I would, uh, when I move, for example, from sit to stand, know if, I have, if the fascia has really been involved because uh, uh, I would feel no muscular effort, but it's a very indirect sensation. So uh, you cannot memorize, memorize anything of the physical work of the fascia. So if you intend to have a, a, a system of human movement in which uh, the elastic structure are playing the greater part, well, the, the physical sensation is, uh, is useless, is, uh, is not interesting. So it's much better to understand what is going to uh, obtain the stretch, what is going to obtain the maximum uh, elastic resistance from the fascia. So what is it? It's geometry. And geometry is made of uh, uh, the memory of geometry and the memory of movements are related, of course. But there is something about the geometry, the memory of geometry, is that uh, uh, to memorize uh, a structure, you need to memorize uh, different spots at the same time. And so this is the idea. So the memory we are interested in is a memory of construction of geometric construction. And so, because we, we want to use uh, the, this uh, passive elastic power, uh, we are also in a certain way uh, in the correct direction when we think that uh, it's useless uh, to memorize the effect, uh, the physical effect of one direction at a time. It's uh, the, the, two, the, two, the two errors or the two problems are absolutely related uh, in my view. The idea of it's, it's a completely new uh, representation of the, this idea of non-doing. Uh, it's not non-doing muscularly. It's uh, non-doing because there are forces that we need to use that do not uh, respond to direct doing. If these uh, tissues or mechanisms respond to uh, geometry, uh, it, there is no point uh, trying to memorize the movement of one part in isolation. So now it's, it's very interesting to, uh, to go just slightly further and, and, and give an image of what uh, would be uh, the result of a conscious guidance of a series of acts and uh, what, is, uh, what are these series of acts and uh, how they could be in fact uh, communicated to a pupil or to oneself because when we uh, give uh, instructions across the room as we say it's uh, as much for the pupil that is listening to us or as for ourselves, because we are also listeners of our own uh, instructions. So here is the, uh, the solution. Well, it's an uh, approximative solution, of course. So we are back with this idea of uh, uh, a person that is kneeling and bringing the hands forward. Uh, I took that, uh, the picture of kneeling because I, I found it was a, a simpler uh, presentation because the legs are fixed on the floor when the person is lean, lean, leaning in that way. Uh, of course, the same or a, a more complex system of orders are necessary when the person is sitting or standing. But in this way, this was very interesting. So we are back with this idea that there is a, uh, a fixed uh, number of movement that are producing a, a distinctive shape and that shape is arch at the front it's very it's very clear yes so you start to imagine what would be the necessary coordinated acts in order to change the position of mechanical advantage uh, disadvantage 
into a position of mechanical advantage in which the, the thoracic curve is preserved that's, uh, and in which the thoracolumbar lumbar curve is really stretched. Well, we, we don't care for the spine really in this. We want the elastic mechanism of the lower back to start functioning because not only are they going to support the cantilever of the upper torso, head and arms forward, but they are it's also going to be a, a very strong connection with the mechanism of the extensors of the legs. Uh, when this is happening, the muscle that is under the thigh is suddenly brought back into play. Or after years and years of not doing anything, suddenly you see that uh, the sitting bones have been moved. So uh, we can command different movements. So here, there are four movements that are command. And uh, uh, if they are produced correctly, uh, what will happen is that the distance from uh, the world. So I have these original, these are the original distances of the spot to a vertical uh, surface of reference. You see the red one is the distance from the throat to a vertical wall. Uh, you have the rebate and that distance. You have the iliac and you have the sitting bones. You can measure all these. And I've reported here, it's the same, I've placed the same distance on the second graphic called B. Yes, the same distance as A are on B. So you will see the difference between where the spots were in the A picture and where they have gone in the B picture. And it's quite interesting to note what are the different movements and what is the, uh, the result of these movements considering their, uh, their range? Because you can see that the sitting bones have moved fairly, fairly little. Yes? Uh, the, well, you could say that the main the movements are massive uh, in the center of the curve. The movement of the iliac back and the movement of the ribs uh, is quite uh, more impressive than the movement here at the sitting bones or the movement at the throat. And yet, with very, very small movements, the combination of very small movement produces a massive change in shape. And so, uh, what is the, the main criteria? Uh, the main criteria is that in the new shape, as I've uh, explained earlier, when I started measuring Alexander's pictures and films and trying to see geometrically what was different into what he was doing and what I was doing, well, there was something that was absolutely obvious. It was that the, uh, the frontal plane of the torso was like a line. Uh, so, of course, uh, you have to understand that as the person is kneeling, uh, of course, uh, the frontal plane of the torso has to be measured differently uh, rather than when the person is, uh, is just uh, sitting upright. Yes. And so we have here uh, the expression of what would happen if the person was giving a, a direction of the throat forward in space. Look at this. We ask the person to direct the throat forward. That's what the, uh, the dot uh, and uh, the arrow are showing. We, I'm asking the person that is sitting and kneeling in this disadvantaged position, I ask the person to go forward while you see that the result is that the spot has gone back. We are asking the person to memorize a movement of a spot in a certain direction, while when you look at the result, you will find that in fact it has gone in the opposite direction. So if the person was to memorize a feeling, she, she would memorize that she's going back in space, because she is. She would never memorize that in order to go back in space, but keep, uh, create the position of mechanical advantage, she's in fact got to direct the spot forward. You imagine the problem of memory here? It's like uh, you are di directing a movement, which is a pull in a certain direction, because if you don't pull the throat forward and you pull the middle of the curve here backward, 
what will happen is that the sort is going to be back in space but not as little as this it's going to go very far back and the upper curve of the spine is not going to be improved so it's absolutely necessary that the person understands what is the uh the, the mechanism we are working with and because we are working with a uh, fairly stiff rubber torso that's how Alexander uh, describes. You have a fairly stiff rubber bag, and that fairly stiff rubber bag is already arched forward. So if you want to change the shape of that elastic, a fairly stiff rubber bag, you need to apply, well, directions of movements that are absolutely contrary to what you would feel when either somebody is moving the parts for you or you are moving the parts so the orders are not describing any feeling or even sometime any um, like movement that are going to happen in the performance they are movement that are applied to mechanism so this explains uh, why the problem of memory is so great and what I, why Alexander had such difficulty implementing his conscious guidance and control system. So I wanted you to see this and to reason about this because uh, this is uh, uh, at, at the same time showing the well uh, before and after image there is a position of mechanical advantage a disadvantage on the a and then we see that we can produce a new position that is going to be for us a position of mechanical advantage and uh, this is uh, in fact created by applying a series of movement to a mechanism and not a uh, uh, different uh, movement that should be right we are at a different level we are not at the na naive and uh, first uh, uh, I, I make a movement and i get an, uh, and obtain some result uh, is that movement correct a movement in isolation cannot be correct ever it's, uh, you have to understand that when we work with mechanism, it's a series of movements and uh, these series of movement produce a result that is either in the right direction or the wrong direction. So uh, you cannot memorize uh, like um, what could it be to have the back to lengthen and widen. Back to lengthen and widen is not a feeling. Back to lengthen and widen is uh, in fact uh, the complex representation of a series of acts applied at the same time so to yep. have a length and a widen back or to have the uh, fascia stretched so the spring system is working are results of a series of movements that you do uh, together yes exactly and so it's more important to memorize uh, the process uh, or alexander sometimes called the principle of construction than to try and memorize uh, uh, simple words and try to associate with w these words with uh, with uh, an impression of uh, what it is we don't care for the impression of what it is is going to change all the time what we care is to understand the mechanical construction uh, Alexander says psycho mechanical construction that's uh, that's the main thing and for uh, um, Alexander teachers who are listening to this uh, what you're saying is a feeling of um, being free or releasing is also a feeling. It's not, um, yeah. that's not exempt from being, from doing according to feeling. Well, it's a, it's a basis of doing according to feeling. It's a basis of engaging. Yes. If you are dealing with a, a complex mechanism or even three mechanism working together that are well, uh, very complex, all, separately and so you can imagine all together so yes um, feeling free feeling ease uh, is just part of the somatic uh, construction of the somatic world but uh, if you want to in fact really help people to direct their structure so as to obtain positions of mechanical advantage at will 
it, it it, it will not work and it will never work. You could spend uh, uh, lifetimes on it, it will not work, certainly not. I have observed many uh, senior teachers that were using that somatic technique. And uh, if you observe how they, uh, even when they are working, because when they are working, uh, the situation is very clear. They, of, most of the time, their hands are placed, which uh, we have a close end chain and we can really observe how they orientate the different movements of the parts. And it's uh, obvious that, uh, well, uh, they are not at all creating positions of mechanical advantage in the way Alexander was capable to do so very, very reliably. So, yes, you're right. Uh, sensory appreciation is faulty uh, because we deal with complex mechanisms. Uh, that's for this only reason, sensory appreciation, feeling free or feeling ease, <laughs> Uh, has very little uh, correspondence with uh, the, the reality of the movements of the different parts, very, very little. It's astonishing how uh, little we are informed by what we feel on the real movements of the different parts. Astonishing. Yes, and even uh, I'm, I'm saying this um, considering people that have, uh, well, during their lives, their lifetime, have uh, tried to investigate their feeling to uh, study uh, embodied cognition or uh, this uh, body awareness. Body awareness is, uh, is, is not uh, a suitable tool to organize positions of mechanical advantage that are real and that can be filmed. So that is, um, that is uh, closing the discussion for today. Excellent, okay, thank you, Jondo. Um, for everyone watching the video, you'll get links to Jondo's websites and how to book a lesson with him underneath the video. And we will see you in the next video. So thank you, Jondo. Thank you, Kevin.